Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. I was glad when they said unto me, come to the house of the Lord. You know, pastors would always say that, and I would always, you know, it was just like something that a pastor, but I, I got to tell you, man, I'm happy to be in the house of God. Anybody just happy to be in the house of the Lord? I'm not just saying that. Amen. To go with me to Isaiah chapter 1. Verse 18, the Lord kind of put this word in my, in, in my mind, in my heart. I was actually thinking of a verse that would kind of summarize what the Lord would want to say today. And the verse that God put in my heart was Isaiah 118, which says, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins are, are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, though they are red like crimson. They shall be as wool. Amen? Let's, uh, let's pray. I'm getting some feedback. I don't know if we have a, a sound man here. Amen? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing today. We pray, God, that you would take control, Lord, of everything that we say and do. Let it bring glory and honor to your precious name. We thank you, God, that we stand forgiven before you today, notwithstanding who we are, notwithstanding what we've done, Lord, you look beyond our faults and you see our need and you meet that need and you draw us near to you, Lord God, though in truth we should be nowhere near you, Lord God, but you open up the door, Lord God, and you let us in, oh God, and you cleanse us, Father. I pray that you would speak today through your precious word, Lord. Let this be a word that would fill us up, Lord, and take us to a new place with you, Father, in Jesus' name. We pray, amen and amen. You may be seated if you can. And <clears throat> so many of you might not get the joke associated with the, the title of today's message, which I've lovingly titled, I Will Cut You. I Will Cut You. And uh, the, that, that particular phrase was coined by an actress by the name of Angela Johnson in a mad TV uh, skit years ago where she, um, I wouldn't say she culturally mis misappropriated uh, the name because she is half Mexican and half Native American, but um, she, she developed a char character called Bon Quiqui. Do we have a picture of Bon Quiqui up there? We have it? There she goes, Bon Quiqui. And so... Um, so I was, I, I was reading a portion of scripture, believe it or not, and Banquiqui came to my mind as I was reading the scripture and, and that particular skit because, see, with Banquiqui, everything is cool unless your order becomes complicated. So if, if your order be, you know, if you say, hold the pickles, okay, uh, she just calls security, right? She calls security over to you, uh, something her manager uh, didn't really appreciate very much. And, uh, but if, uh, if things got out of hand, uh, that is to say, if she got a little bit too upset, then she resorted to like, you know, you know, I will, I will cut you. I will cut you. And, uh, and so that's what she would said. I, I don't think she ever really cut anybody as far as I know, uh, in the comedy routine, but <clears throat> I can, I can totally relate, relate to her. As many of you know, you know, I, I'm Puerto Rican and I was raised in the Bronx and so Banquiqui really represented 90% of my people, right? Like, so, but as, as I, I'm there in, 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 uh, in Florida, in the general council of the assemblies of God, you know, and we're talking about all this godly stuff, and I'm looking around at people, and I'm saying to myself, truthfully, you know, we have all become Banquiqui. Like, everybody that claims to be Christian has now become Bon quickly, because you know, God forbid, God forbid, you know, it, you know, we have to love a little bit too much, or you pass certain boundaries, or, or you do certain things. We talked about right fear and offense. We're gonna get offended. We're gonna get. We're gonna lose it. And I wish I could say that being saved somehow immunizes you from this influence. But truth be told, that doesn't appear to be the case. There's an essay 
<clears throat> it's called, a poem actually, it's called An Essay on Criticism, Part 2, written in 1711 by a gentleman by the name of Alexander Pope. And we actually misquote a particular portion of this poem, but this is, this is that portion in context. It says, Ah, ne'er so dire a thirst of glory boast, nor in the critic let the man be lost. Good nature and good sense must ever join. To err is humane, to forgive divine. To err is humane, to, to make mistakes. That is to take actions or, or to enter, entertain thoughts for which we later have regrets. It's a part of the human condition it speaks to our nature as human beings. David frames our dilemma perfectly in Psalm 51, one of my favorite Psalms. I'm reading from verse three, it says, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sins are ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned. And then this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin that my mother conceived me. These are words of, of a repentant David that was challenged by Nathan the prophet because even though he loved God, he ended up doing some really crazy and dumb stuff. He sent the man to his death. He committed adultery with, what, with one of his mighty men's wives. And so the Holy Spirit just brought a conviction on David. And, and here he's saying, I was born a sinner. And by the way, the woman who gave birth to me was a sinner at the time. The Apostle Paul, more than anyone else in Scripture, goes nuts on the topic, saying things like, none is righteous, no, not one, Romans 3.10 just a couple of verses later, in verses 23, he says, For all have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standards. This, of course, takes us to an interesting paradox, which Paul straight out talks about in Romans chapter 7. My, my favorite chapter of Scripture. Because, to be honest with you, Romans 7 doesn't make sense to the religious. We want to kind of forget Romans chapter 7. We, Romans chapter 8, you know, there's that, therefore now no condemnation. We love it. But, but, but chapter 7 is Paul confessing stuff that we don't want to hear about people who claim to be ministers of the gospel. Because the truth be told, we expect our ministers to be perfect, to be sinless, to be saintly, to be above reproach. Oh, if that were true, blessed be the name of the Lord. But I, I, I got something to tell you, man. God chooses the foolish things of this world to confine the wise. He doesn't pick us because we're particularly talented or because we're special. He picks us because he loves us. He picks us because he believes in us when we don't believe in ourselves. Amen. He picks us because we're imperfect. I've always said that about God. He's a lover of imperfection. I'm not saying go out and sin. I'm saying, you know what? Go out and get forgiven. Right. And walk in that forgiveness and preach that forgiveness. Yeah. In that chapter... We see a paradox, and I think I should define the word. A paradox is a statement or proposition that seems self-contradictory or absurd, but in reality expresses a possible truth. He starts off by saying something that should be obvious to anyone who's decided to follow Jesus Christ. He says, I've discovered this principle in life, this rule, this axiom, that when I want to do what is right, 
I want to do what is right. I inevitably do what is wrong. Mind blowing. I always said that if, if the Apostle Paul were, were to apply for credentials in the Assemblies of God, he would be brought in by the Credentials Committee to speak particularly about Romans chapter 7. The good that I would, I do not, but the evil that I would not, that I do. Can you share with us exactly what you mean by that? But the truth is, we want to do what's right. Anybody here want to do what's right? Hello, somebody? But sometimes we don't do it. Or we do stuff that we shouldn't be doing. Then Paul goes on to say something ironic that's really pivotal to the point that, that we're trying to make this morning by the Holy Spirit. Listen to how he precisely paints this paradox, this portrait. He says, I love God's law with all of my heart. It's an interesting way to start that little part of it. I love God's law. I want, I want that to be my starting point in what I'm about to say. It's not about lack of love. But there's another power within me that's at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Paul is saying, I love God, but it doesn't appear to stop me from sinning which of course seems, at least on the surface, to contradict what I've taught from this pulpit for years and years and years. And that is that if you really want to stop sinning, you've got to get to the point where you really love God. You have to love God with all of your heart, your mind, your soul. You have to love him completely and entirely. But I've neglected actually to deal with something else. Sometimes we still love sin. It's not that we don't love God, is that, is that we love God and we love to sin. And so sometimes those two come into conflict with one another and sometimes guess what wins at times? But truth be told, we don't free ourselves from the slavery of sin simply by resolving that we will no longer sin. Has anybody here ever made a resolve to stop doing something? Have I? Just one or two people? I should ask the question, has anyone not resolved <laughs> to stop doing something? <laughs> if you're perfect here today, I apologize in advance. Okay, this, this message is not for you. Amen? It's for the rest of us that don't quite have it all together. But we still love Jesus. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Give God some praise. We're still in love with the Lord. And though sometimes we give up on ourselves, we know that the God that we love and we serve, he doesn't give up on us. And he finds us where we are. That's what I love about God, man. He doesn't mind sticking his hand in a garbage can and pulling us out. Come on, somebody, give God some praise. He's not queasy about that. He's a holy God that doesn't, ma doesn't mind putting his hand on a leper. And making himself unclean. Why? Because that leper needs to be touched. He needs to be healed. But more importantly, he needs to be touched. God wants to touch you this morning. God wants to go beyond the facade, beyond the external that we have put out there, man. Beyond the religion. Back in 1987, there was a public service announcement. Some of you that have been around for a while will remember this. They used none other than Michael Jordan, right? 
And, and the failed public service announcement was don't do drugs. Don't do drugs. People did more drugs. We don't get free from the slavery of sin by simply repeating the phrase, don't do sin, don't sin, don't sin, don't sin over and over again to ourselves. As many of you know, as all of us know, that will work for a while. Doesn't it work for a while? It works for a while. But at the end of the day, we inevitably backslide into the patterns of behavior however hurtful or self-destructive they might be. And it's not like we're ignorant of it. We totally know how self-destructive they are. But we become accustomed to them. It's become the norm. It's the devil that we know. And so we allow, we allow that to happen and we, we give ourselves, we give in to these, these desires, we give in to these thoughts. But at the end of the day, it is about loving God, but it's about loving a God above and beyond. It's about loving God so much that that love for him overcomes Whatever, whatever it is that the enemy is using us, using to keep us trapped, to keep, to keep us bound. And as we totally fall in love with, anybody in love with Jesus here today? As we totally fall in love with Jesus, things change. First of all, we change. I'm not saying we're perfect, but we're not who we used to be. Amen. I'm not saying that at the back of our minds, we still don't battle that attraction. But you know what? We're more attracted to Jesus. Amen. It's very interesting. I think a lot of times when it comes to our personal relationships, we would like to think that our mate, that our husband or wife or our, our fiance, fiance or whatever is, is not attracted to anyone else. You're not attracted. But we would be fooling ourselves. Because the issue is not being attracted to somebody. It's who holds your heart. Come on, somebody. Who holds your heart? If you're in love with Jesus, it don't make a difference. And then the Holy Spirit prompts us as to what to do to deal with that inside of us. As long as we give in to the leading of the Holy Spirit. You know what? The word of God said, we're tempted, but the issue is, is not to allow ourselves to be entrapped, not to allow ourselves to fall into that sin pattern, into, in that sin as a whole. And then ultimately that sin pattern, which is just, just of course, is a matter of repetition of whatever it is that we're dealing with. We change, and we begin to, to, we love God, and then we love the people whom he loves. It's just a command that Jesus gave personally in John 13, 24, that we would love one another, and that that love for one another would serve as proof to the world, to, to, to unbelievers, that we are in fact disciples of Christ. It's not about how good we preach, how great the band is, how wonderful the worship session was. It's about how much we love one another. And here, by the way, it's talking about loving one another. You know, we want to we love the world, but we don't love each other. There's, there's a problem with that. The Apostle Peter, which we're going to speak about in a few minutes, adds something really interesting to, on the subject in his first epistle. 1 Peter chapter 4, starting at verse 7, he says, the end of the world is coming soon. Can somebody say amen? Amen. I mean, we know that's true. We just finished that, that series on end times that I did. Never has that been more true than now. Then he goes on to say, therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Be earnest and disciplined 
in your prayers. I was speaking to Pastor Lee about that this week. You know, we were talking again about the parable of the ten virgins. It keeps coming up. Specifically, the five that were wise. There were five that were wise. There were five that were special. And the five that were wise, they were wise, why? Because they realized that they needed their inventory of oil at the right level so that the lamp could keep shining. And I've said this in the past when I was talking about this, and I'll repeat it because it's important, that the, the, the fact that the lamp would stay on in the temple was not an optional thing. That lamp had to stay on. It represented the manifest presence of God. It represented Torah. It, represents, it represented truth. Light means truth. Yes. In the New Testament, light means Jesus. Yeah. And we need to do whatever we need to do to make sure that that light stays on. Yeah. The church today Oftentimes, it's not that city on a hill. It's not that lamp on the lampstand. Why? Because we've allowed our oil to seep out. We got the lamp, man. We got the wick. We got everything. What we don't have is the oil of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is not an option to the Pentecostal evangelical church. He is essential. He is essential. If we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's not about a determination. It's about an infilling. It's not about a preaching. It's about a visitation. They were ready for the bridegroom because they made sure that they had enough oil. Then he goes on to say, most important of all. He puts it right up on top. It's not just important, but the most important thing of all. And why would that be? It says to continue to show deep love for each other. Then he goes on and uses the word for. In Greek, that's the word hati. It means because. It supplies a justification. It says continue to show deep love for one another. Because love covers a multitude of sins. That phrase, love covers, is a combination of two Greek terms. Love is not just phileo, you know. You know, it's not, it's not brotherly love. It's not eros. It's, it's agape. It speaks to divine, a, 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 a love that does not derive from human origin. It says love covers. The word cover is kalepte, which means to veil, hide, hide, conceal, or envelop. Certain of Noah's sons loved him. And they loved him so much that when their father had his moment, and when I say he had a moment, I mean he had a moment. Okay? He gets drunk and naked. And his sons come in and they're like, oh, okay. Uh, and, they, and they cover out of respect and honor. They cover his nakedness. We are instructed to demonstrate God's love, agape love, by veiling or concealing or, or by not exposing one another's faults to the public at large in order to shame one another. Within the house of God. This is not, we're not talking about sinners. You know why? Because if one, looked, if one of us looks bad, all of us look bad. Do you know that? You know, they will judge you by the sins of the people that are around you. And so it behooves us, you know, that's a problem. In the church, we have learned to kill our wounded. That's not the way an army operates, my friends. 
An army is an army. An army is one because they've come to a conclusion. When one of them is wounded, we drag him. We do whatever we need to do. Because that wounded soldier could be you. And we put ourselves in harm's way if we need to. You know, people will die. Soldiers will die, three, four of them, in a rescue attempt. And they won't do the math. They'll say, well, we lost three guys trying to save one. The math is irrelevant. The point is we do not leave anyone behind. Oh, that the church of Jesus Christ would develop that heart of God. We do not leave anyone behind. We grab them. We lift them up. We know that God has a calling on their life. We've got nothing against Uber drivers, but how many ministers have to become Uber drivers before we learn? That there's love and mercy in the house of God. That God is a God of restoration. That God is a God of second chances. That God is a God, God who will take a murderer like Paul. Who hated Christians. And have them write the majority of the book that we regard as sacred. Holy scripture. Jesus himself tells us, he says, in the Our Father, he teaches us to pray. And what does he say? He says, when you pray, and he throws his line in, and, and help, help me to forgive, Lord, Lord, help me to forgive the, my, my, my transgressors, my debtors, as you have forgiven me. He actually ties the two. Whatever forgiveness that you're looking to get from God, Jesus is saying you better have that same forgiveness for somebody else. They sin against you. I know you're hurt. I was hurt too. You coming to me for forgiveness? Forgive the person that hurt you first. Leave your gift on the altar, man. Go out there and make it right. Then come back. So why, why would Peter say this is the most important thing? Because sometimes our love for Jesus will not be enough to stop us from acting foolishly and doing really dumb things. I'm going to repeat that again. That's your Instagram moment for today. Because sometimes our love for Jesus will not be enough to stop us from acting foolishly. Can I hear an amen? amen. And doing really dumb things. Can I, can I hear a really strong amen, amen on that one? Amen. amen? Enter Peter. Anybody love Peter? I love Peter. Peter, I'm, I, two guys, Paul, Peter, when I go to heaven... I'm going to have conversations with both of them, different conversations. But Peter, Peter is special. Peter, I refer to as Jesus' homeboy. He's his guy. You know, he's that, we all have a friend like, you ever have a friend like that, man, i do anything for you. we tight. That was, that, that was Peter. <clears throat> And he, he, as far as he's concerned, he had it like that with Jesus. Wasn't the kind of person to hold back on how he felt. He's going to let you know how he feel, whether you like it or not. In Matthew 16, starting at verse 21, Jesus tells his disciples, including Peter, everything that's going to be happening to him, including the fact that he's going to be tortured and killed, raised up on the third day. Peter listens to Jesus and... And decides to take Jesus to the side. What if God says literally that Peter takes Jesus to the side to reprimand Jesus? That's his friend. And he says to Jesus, I will not let this happen to you. 
know, all that stuff you said right now. I'm, I, re- I reject that. I will not let that happen to you. Jesus looks him in the face, verse 23, and what's his response? Get thee behind me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. I always, I always wonder what, the, what Peter's reaction was to his homeboy, Jesus, when he's, he's saying, dude, I got your back, and Jesus goes, get thee behind me, Satan. You are a, you are a dangerous trap to me. Jesus' next statement gives us a hint of, of Peter's general problem. Because he doesn't just leave it there. Jesus kindly explains it to Peter why he's, why he's talking to him like this. He says, you are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God. Not from God's point of view. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Basically, Peter, you're thinking like the world. Okay? You're thinking, you're talking like the world, you're thinking like the world. And as such, you are a dangerous trap to me. This, isn't that interesting? You know, we have to have the mind of Christ, not the mind of the world. When Christians begin to listen, hello, to the, to the counsel of the people in this world, and we begin to adapt ourselves to other people's opinion instead of God's word, we're in trouble. Matthew 26, 31, Jesus tells his disciples that they would all fall away, that they would basically abandon him. Peter, of course, gets offended and objects to this statement, telling Jesus in verse 33, though they all fall away, though they all abandon you, meaning the other disciples, he's throwing all the other disciples under the bus, I will never. Look at your neighbor and say, I will never. I will never abandon you. That's, that, that sounds great, doesn't it? Jesus then turns to him and, and pops his little bubble. And publicly, he, he said this publicly. Jesus you said this publicly, I'm going to say this publicly. You will not only fall away, you will not only abandon me, Peter, but before the cock crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times. Now, you know, Peter was upset to begin with, now, Peter, and I believe that Peter was being sincere. I believe his heart, this is, I believe he really meant this. He sincerely, in verse, in verse 35, tells Jesus, not only will I not deny you, but I will die before denying you if I have to. I will die for you, Jesus. I will not only not deny you, but I will die for you. Hindsight is 2020, just a few verses later. He denies him twice to two servant girls. The word of God goes out of its way. I mean, he's being chased and crucified by crazy people. And I, I could see if, 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 if the Sanhedrin with guards came to came to Peter and said, you know, aren't you one of his disciples? You know, you're like, okay, I'm going to get arrested and killed. But no, some servant girl. She's like, uh, aren't you, uh, weren't you following Jesus? No. What are you talking about? Then another servant girl. You know, you, you really look familiar. Like, you know, what's with you people? No. Then... The word of God really, it just presses the point. It says a, just a bunch of bystanders come to him. Like, you know, the crowd, just people. Now, you look like you were with Jesus. 
And he's like, no. And the cock crows. That was a long night. The word of God says something very interesting. It says he went out and wept bitterly. Because up until now, we're, we're, just, we're just looking at a two-face, right? Who was hypocritical in terms of his alleged love and allegiance to Jesus. And we would dismiss him as such if it weren't for the way this story ends. Which is when, when the cock crows, he goes out and he weeps bitterly before God. Why? Because he betrayed the one he loves. Have you ever betrayed the one you love? Just before this happens, there's a fascinating part of the story that takes place, which is what brought me to Bonquiqui and, and today's message. And, and it's found in Luke chapter 22, starting at verse 47. It says, the Bible tells us, while he was still speaking, a crowd came. Okay, now this is happening in the Garden of Gethsemane at the foot of the Mount of Olives. Jesus had prayed, the word of God says, that his sweat was like blood. God was breaking capillaries in his, I mean, this is, Jesus was anguishing in prayer. And, and the guards are coming in. Okay, so this is what happens. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up. And the man who was called Judas, one of the 12, was leading them. Now this is, again, in context, this is before the wept bitterly part. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the son of man with a kiss? This is how this is going to go down? You're going to betray me with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? Now, this takes me back to the Bronx. All right? Things are going crazy. It's getting hot. Okay? The other gang showed up. We're like, Jesus? Now, when they say, when they say should we deal with this with our sword, it implies they were packing. <laughs> so much for walking with Jesus for three years. They're packing. Jesus, just tell us, man. Right? We're going to, this is, this is going to be a movie, like, you know. So we have a sellout Judas doing his traitor thing. We got the disciples. You know, they see what's going on. Got betrayed by this guy. We're going to deal with him. But we can deal with these guards. Jesus, give us a word. Before Jesus has a chance to respond, verse 50, one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. Jesus didn't even, didn't get, even get to answer the question. One of these disciples takes out a sword and he's like, don't even answer Jesus. This is a Jinsu knife commercial. We're just going to dice and slice, cut the guy's ear off. This is crazy behavior for anybody, but, but these weren't just anybody's guys. These were the 12 disciples of, of Christ. These are 12 guys that were subsequently be used by God to transform the world. Men that walked daily with Jesus for three years. Who didn't... Who, who didn't sit, didn't sit under Pastor Mario's teaching. I can understand this bon quique behavior from people who hung out with me, right? I'm a Puerto Rican from the Bronx. I can get that. But this is behavior from people who supposedly, I want you to get this, man. These are people who supposedly learn how to act like a Christian from a guy called Jesus. Christ. 
And they're taking out knives, cutting people's ears off. The Gospel of John, just to, so that we wouldn't die out of, you know, with curiosity, does us a favor and identifies the disciple, the culprit of the disciples. Guess who this is. John 18, then Simon Peter, who had a sword, hello, was packing, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. Then it goes on to say, the servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Put that away. What's wrong with you, Peter? I mean, seriously, what is wrong with you? Have you not learned anything? You know, if our minds are not renewed, then our actions will not be transformed. The Apostle Paul put it this way in Romans 12 too, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. Don't be a banquiqui, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. John 21, we learn that Peter eventually found his way after the resurrection. Jesus finds him just like he finds you and me. And he's talking to him. And on three occasions, he denied him three times on three occasions, he asked, he asked Peter, do you love me? And three times, Peter repeats the same answer. In fact, Peter gets increasingly frustrated every time that Jesus asks the question. Don't be frustrated when Jesus asks you a question. He asks you a question for a reason because every single time he asked him a question, asked him a question, and he responded, yes, I do. Jesus responded by saying, prove it. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I do. Feed my lambs. You love me? Be here on Tuesday doing evangelism. Reaching out to people that have never come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That don't have an idea of who Jesus is. Babies, teach, feed them my word. Peter, do you love me? Jesus, you know I love you. Take care of my sheep. Not lambs, my sheep. Mentor and pastor the new converts to get them to, the, to a place of, of spiritual maturity. Help transform them into leaders. I asked this question the last time. Peter, do you love me? Jesus, you know me. I know I did that crazy stuff, but you know my heart, man. You know I love you. Feed my sheep. Disciple the called. Send the mature. Equip the people who have chosen to build the kingdom. He became the leader. Peter, this crazy, knife-wielding maniac, the Bonquique of the group, becomes the head of the Jerusalem council. Paul had to go to him and James to get, they had to get permission. Anybody here was Catholic? Who, who was Peter to the Catholic Church? The first pope. The man. He's the man upon this rock in their minds. But really is confession. But, but we, we don't disagree on the fact. We do not disagree on the fact that he was the boss. Right. Even after he was the boss, the apostle Paul finds it necessary to publicly correct him. Because just because you're saved and just because you're pastor so-and-so doesn't mean you can't do dumb stuff. And it's interesting that the word of God would actually write, you, you would think they wouldn't write this down. 
But they want you and I to, to see that even a leader, even somebody whose shadow Come on. Can, can heal the sick, yeah. can do dumb stuff. Galatians 2, when Peter came to Antioch, I told, I told him, <laughs> it says face to face, I told him to his face that he was wrong. I love, I love Paul. He used to eat with Gentile followers of the Lord until James sent some Jewish followers. Peter was afraid of the Jews and soon stopped eating with the Gentiles. And he and the other Jews hid their true feelings so well that even Barnabas, now Barnabas was like Paul's homeboy. They went out to preach together. He says, even Barnabas was fooled. But when I saw that they were not really obeying the truth that is in the good news the gospel, I corrected Peter in front of everybody and said, Peter, you are a Jew, but you live like a Gentile. So how can you force Gentiles to live like Jews? Come on. Yeah. In front of your little Jewish friends here. Peter, you're a hypocrite. You're a hypocrite. Stop it. Iron sharpens iron. Iron sharpens iron. Very interesting. This is the very same Peter, right, to which God throws a blanket from heaven and puts unclean animals on it and says to him, take and eat. And Peter says, no, I've never eaten an unclean animal. And then God tells him, what I have cleaned, do not call unclean, meaning the Gentiles. And he's still acting dumb. But that's Peter, right? That's not any of us. No, 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 no. We, we're holy. We have it together, man. We walk in obedience to God. I'm being sarcastic. But what we can do today is not be hypocritical. And not worry about how we look to somebody else. So we can be accepted by them like Peter. But instead, worry about how we look to God. And say, God, I know I've been thinking things I shouldn't be thinking. I've been doing things I shouldn't be doing. I've had attitudes against other brothers and sisters in Christ that I shouldn't have. Unforgiveness. I'm all condemning when you have done the opposite with me. You have been forgiving. You have been a good, good father. Lord, change my heart, change my mind. I don't want to be like this anymore. I want to be real. I want to be true. I want to not just say that I love you, but live like I do. I want to be obedient, not in my head, but in my life. I want people in this world to take a look at me God forbid that they see me. Let them look at me and see you. Yes. Let your presence be so invasive of everything in th that I am that what I present to the world is not a Mario but Jesus. Make me more like you, Lord. I want to be more like you and less like me. I need to be more like you and less like me. Let's bow our heads in prayer.